All right. Hi, everybody. Welcome to our Immersion Virtual Roundtable series. I am Jamie Thomason. I am a learning partner and a simulation specialist here at Immersion. I'm so pleased to have you with us today. We are very excited to have Brian Cole and Lisa Desai from MindWise with us. Joining me from the Immersion side, you might see some responses back in the chat is Diane Mullins, who's one of our business development directors. And then I also have with me my VP of Identity and Growth, Ms. Christina Yu. And Christina is going to give us a brief overview of immersion for anyone who's new to us. And then she's going to turn things over to MindWise. We're going to show you a couple of examples of how immersion might be utilized to practice the strategies that Brian and Lisa are going to share with us, and we'll make certain we have time for a little Q&A afterwards. So I'm going to turn things over to Christina. Again, welcome everyone and enjoy. Hi everyone. Welcome to our Future of Work virtual roundtable series. For those of you who aren't familiar with Mersion, we are a VR for emotional intelligence company. So what that means is that we use simulations to power experiential learning for essential workplace skills like leadership, communication, and empathy. We're essentially a virtual environment for practicing difficult conversations, whether that's motivating an underperforming team, de-escalating inter-office conflict, or adapting different work styles to maximize team performance. The idea behind the technology is that we're using the power of VR and simulation, the power of presence and plausibility, not just to create a thrilling sense of immersion, but to actually improve human interaction. Learners experience a simulation, a high stakes interpersonal situation, whether that's a performance review or a microaggression that allows them to feel the stress of a real conversation and achieve an ideal blend of safety and danger at once. So it's safe enough that the learner can try new things, can make mistakes and learn from them, find their voice. It's dangerous enough to actually recreate the stress of the encounter, you know, the beating heart, the awkwardness, the confusion, sweaty palms, so that the learner emerges from the simulation inoculated for the stress of that moment and feels confident and prepared to handle those conversations in real life. So just as we can use a virtual environment to recreate physical dangers and create that sense of immersion, we can use a virtual environment to recreate emotional and cognitive dangers so that when we encounter them on the job, we are prepared. We apply this technology in a number of domains for developing frontline skills like sales and customer service and for improving internal interactions like leadership, human resources, diversity and inclusion. Now, despite what this picture shows, we don't believe these areas are separate at all. The truth is that leadership and inclusive mindset good salesmanship, service thinking, all these are often one and the same. They blend into each other. Empathy is a foundation for all these domains, and it's impossible to talk about empathy in the workplace, whether it's education in the classroom, clinical soft skills for healthcare, or high stress military scenarios without talking about mental health. So to lead us in our discussion about mental health today, we have Brian from MindWise, MindWise is a firm which equips schools, workplaces, colleges, and communities with tools to help them address mental health issues, substance abuse, and suicide risk, enabling their members to live healthier lives. Turn it over to Brian. Christina, thank you. And Mersion, thank you for, for bringing us, allowing us to be here today. I'm going to pop up a slide and we'll get started here. So just want to confirm that you guys are uh, able to see this slide. And Brian, I'm going to interrupt you very quickly and share two things. One, when you're leaning in and close to your microphone, it seems to be a little clearer. We get a little garbly when you lean back. And two, uh, just want to let everybody know that Brian has agreed to join us today and share his knowledge on his birthday. So I want to acknowledge that. I meant to do it at the top. But thank you so much. And happy birthday, Brian. Oh, thank you for spending your time. Happy birthday. It just shows thank how you. very important this is to you and meaningful it is. And I just want you to know that I appreciate your time doing that. So thank you. Wow. I'm going to take myself off camera so that I can watch the chat. And, uh, and not be distracting with my head moving back and forth. But uh, just so you know, you're getting lots of happy birthday messages <laughs> coming through. 
<laughs> oh, that's great, guys. Thank you, thank, Jamie. I don't, I don't know. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and absolutely, really, just delighted to be here. Uh, and delighted to share this time with Lisa Desai. Lisa, if you could introduce yourself real quick. Hi, I'm Lisa Desai. I'm also with MindWise Innovations, working with Brian. Um, I am Director of Behavioral Health Consulting, and a psychologist by profession, but as I like to say, do not be scared, but I'm a psychologist. I don't read minds. Um, and just delighted to be here today. And, and you know, I mean, let's, let's be honest. She, Lisa, is the Chief Behavioral Health Officer. She's got... Oh. ID behind her name. So we're, um, we're delighted to be here, as I said, and I think we today want to punctuate the point, the white font here, why practicing these kinds of conversations within the workplace, at home, within the community, is so important. So to get started, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, why we're appreciative you're here. Look, this content isn't easy. We're talking about mental health and substance use and substance misuse. So we, we very, very much appreciate you being here. We recognize that sometimes these conversations aren't easy, uh, more reason to have them. So Lisa, wh why now? Why, why are we talking about this stuff now? And why, why it work? What's, what's been the turning point, if at all? So, so uh, you know, I, I've been thinking that why now is very much because it's, it's in our face with COVID-19. There's so much in the media. There is so much about how um, difficult it is to balance working from home in a variety of ways. So, um, it, you know, in some ways, talking about it now is, um, is expected. It's, um, it's unavoidable. So that's the why now. Um, yeah. The question is, it, you know, is that the only reason we're talking about it now? And I would say absolutely not. This has been a long-term issue at work, in our lives, and it's important that we find a way to talk about it. I think what's, what's been encouraging for us as we engage organizations and communities and schools across the globe, what's been encouraging is that there is an appetite. There's a burgeoning appetite. And we could argue that that appetite has always been there, but there's a burgeoning appetite to talk about this stuff. I, uh, I often think back to something my father shared with me just, just recently. You know, he said when he looked back over his career, he, he realized that the expression checking your baggage at the door did more harm than good. That it was, it was in his words, asinine to think that any of us could quote unquote check our baggage at the door. And I, I carry that with me now um, and, and really recognize that it's, it's not in anyone's best interest and it's not possible. So what we wanna do is we're gonna, we're gonna put up a poll question for you. We wanna engage you guys on right now on where you are, where your organization is as it pertains to how it's addressing mental health. So Jamie, if you wanna post that poll and we'll take a look at that feedback. And, and while you're while the polls being posted, I want to just say, you know, I think Brian's uh, dad was onto something. There was a recent HBR article, HBR article that just came out um, that said 40% of employees in their study actually wanted to talk about mental health in the workplace. So maybe we've had it all wrong in thinking that people aren't comfortable talking about it. Maybe it's because the environment is not one where there's comfort. Hmm. All right, so how is mental health treated in your workplace? It's not talked about at all. Hasn't been operationalized. There's this unofficial policy, but hasn't been operationalized. Uh, very different now that uh, COVID-19 is a reality. Uh, or there is an official wellness program. All right, so let's post the results and let's see where uh, the majority of you came in. Great, encouraging. encouraging. Fantastic. Would love, would love to hear more from, well, from all of you, but really curious to hear what's working with those that have an official wellness program. And then what's it going to take for those of you that don't have an official wellness program, uh, what's it gonna take to move them? So thank you, thank you for that. And we'll revisit some of those findings shortly. So as we move forward, Lisa. 
So um, just going to touch upon Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Many of you are likely familiar with this. And I talk about it because I think many of us take for granted more basic needs in that hierarchy, uh, food, shelter, safety, um, being able to kind of meet our minimal needs in that way. Um, but in this, in this pandemic, that hierarchy has been turned sideways and upside down so that we're really very much focused on um, you know, is it safe to go out today? What do I need to do to be safe? Do I put on my gloves? Do I put on my mask? I have to, um, these kinds of things. And, and we're less thinking about what, um, you know, what are my goals and my aspirations? I would say that the love and the belonging, that, that sense of relationship has also been central now. Um, and it's key that we think about this because of the impact it has on our mental health. I do find it um, intriguing, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, something that many of us were exposed to back in, well, as early as high school, maybe early college, uh, but now it being something that we're speaking about, talking about almost on a regular basis. So, so I don't think there's anything sorry. surprising here. No, Lisa, go ahead, forgive me. No, I'm gonna let you take this. <laughs> I don't think there's, there's anything surprising here, but just last week, the Kaiser Family Foundation uh, provided some of this data on uh, coronavirus and the negative impact it's had on mental health. Um, give you a minute to digest this. No surprises, but I think um, for those of us in the workplace and for those of us that are nearing a return to work, uh, behooves each and every one of us to anticipate what that increased uh, impact on mental health will have within the workplace. Lisa, anything to add here? Yeah, I think it's important to recognize that this is the impact of uh, the, the pandemic. Remember that in the general population, uh, for adults, 70% of adults in the general population in the United States experienced anxiety, and 40% in the workplace before the pandemic experienced signs of uh, anxiety and depression. So again, highlighting that this was happening even before this current crisis. And Lisa, what do we know about anxiety tied to burnout and what we've recently learned through the World Health Organization on burnout. Yep, huge correlation between burnout, anxiety, depression, stress, um, difficulty managing stress, workplace stress in particular, to the point that the World Health Organization, as Brian just said, uh, in the last year um, formally identified it as an occupational um, disability. So one thing that we, we often talk about within MindWise is this, this kind of this feeling of vulnerability. And uh, as leaders, as managers, as individual contributors, that kind of embracing that vulnerability is awfully, awfully important. Uh, recognizing that it doesn't necessarily mean we're powerless. Uh, Lisa, in a minute, is going to introduce a framework that, that we think is it's a no BS framework. It just cuts to the chase and gives us the tools, the language to address what it is we're experiencing. But I think through the lens for leaders and managers, through the lens of servant leadership, for example, vulnerability is awfully important. And the HBR, the Harvard Business Review article that Lisa referenced moments ago, talks about now more than ever, leaders need to embrace demonstrate that vulnerability, that that in and of itself facilitates psychological safety. So embracing the vulnerability while recognizing it doesn't leave us powerless. Exactly. And so when we're in the midst of instability, and particularly in this particular pandemic, where it's our professional and our personal lives feel very unstable and unpredictable, um, Again, as Brian said, we refer to a framework developed by our, our trauma specialist, safety, predictability, and control. And it's really um, a group of guidelines that help us deal on a day-to-day, week-to-week basis um, used by individuals as well as by organizations. Um, so safety is the idea that um, we know how to take care of our physical safety. We know, again, the mask, the social distancing, so on and so forth. Um, what do we do, though, in terms of our personal sense of safety in the home? Um, how can we create some routines um, that give that predictability? 
So our schedules for work, our ability to go to the office, the things that we relied on as part of our schedules, we can no longer do. So how do we create schedules on a daily basis, not only for ourselves, but for our teams, for our children, for our spouses? Um, and, and then finally, the sense of control. And I think this very much um, comes down to what can we identify in our daily lives that we have control over? There's much going on right now that we have no control over. Um, so how can we, again, help our team members, um, ourselves, and again, our children have some modicum of control by making decisions that they're empowered to make. Um, from an organizational standpoint, um, the safety comes from a sense of being held, um, by psychologically held by a leader. And so much of that is tied to psychological safety. It's about creating a culture where there's clear communication where there's um, a sense of respect and a sense of being honest about um, don't, not really sure what the plan is to, um, to come back to work, but we're working on it and we'll let you know when we have one, but really staying engaged with communication um, and a sense of empowerment to let, um, you know, here in Massachusetts, our return to work um, is uh, May 18th. And most organizations are really giving a lot of flexibility to their employees about when they can return to work. So it's an excellent example of how can you build in some sense of um, empowerment. And then and with, when we think about what some organizations aren't doing, we just recently saw a study that said upwards of 38, almost 40% of organizations have not addressed COVID-19 with their employee base. That's that's, that's shocking. It's the antithesis of what we're recommending around safety, predictability, and control versus, versus some of the progressive thinking organizations that are all over it, twice a week, distributing communications, once a week, doing company-wide town halls. So while some of this really sounds just common sense, it's organizations' ability to execute and follow through on the safety, predictability, and control that's really, really um, critical now more than ever. Lisa, any other examples on safety, predictability, and control through the organizational lens? Um, I think that what you touched upon earlier in terms of the leadership and their being involved from the beginning of implementing, if you're, if you're going to be talking in terms of safety, predictability, and control, and the key leaders are communicating, it's important they stay engaged throughout the process. Yeah, and I think also, let's not forget that hey, we're, we, we started by thanking you for participating, acknowledging that sometimes these conversations aren't easy. My point being that we have to have the language to talk about this stuff. Leaders within organizations aren't born with the language. So part of what's really important, think about the plans, think about those wellness plans you have that have been fully operationalized. Are you being given the language, taught the language to talk about this? Uh, more importantly, are you being given the opportunity as leaders to practice those conversations so that should someone um, approach you, uh, a team member, should someone approach you with a significant issue, are you prepared to have those conversations? And having those conversations breeds a familiarity with, with what you're talking about and also allows for spontaneous conversations. Um, there's, there was a large-scale study in Canada that looked at workplace mental health and, and programs, and one of the findings they had um, was that having these, quote, spontaneous conversations was key so that you, you, they may not happen in a meeting with a manager or with a team. It may be in the hallway. It may be um, on another Zoom call talking about something else. So it's good to be prepared and to have those tools, as Brian's saying, to have the conversations. And Lisa, thank you for not uh, making fun of the icon that I used for control. I don't know, maybe there are a handful of you out there that get it as a controller, but, but anyway, all right. Um, so, so what must happen? What, what's gotta happen to, to ensure that safety, predictability, and control becomes a part of the way work gets done, a part of the way we communicate with our, across our employee base. We have to operationalize psychological safety. You know, what's, what's funny about psychological safety is we've been talking about it for 15, 20 years, and it's been in the last six months, three months, 
that I've seen more written about site safety than I've ever seen across the last 10, 15 years. And I think it's because more now than ever, organizations have to evolve. They've got to look at themselves, they've got to assess their culture and determine, are we quote unquote, psychologically safe? How to operationalize that? I don't know, Lisa, what are some examples of how we might operationalize psych safety? I think it's very much around um, the language that we discussed, having, you know, cannot emphasize this enough, having the openness and providing the environment to talk about it, um, having tools. So, you know, it can be screening, it can be education, it can be leadership. Um, how do we instill um, a sense that we're all learning about this together, we're all committed to this, um, and we're going to talk openly about it? Mm -hmm. We. Um we do some work with a, a pretty large construction company based in, uh, um, in the Northeast. And one way of operationalizing psychological safety was to build it in their morning huddles. Now, again, not rocket science, but now what they do is they ask some questions of their team at the job site in those huddles. Those questions are associated with behavioral health. How do you feel physically? You prepared for work? Uh, any distractions right now. So they've literally operationalized psychological safety through the checklist in their morning huddles on the job site every morning. Truly, truly remarkable. And again, back to that progressive thinking organization, those that are really looking at their culture and making the improvements they know they need to make. And it, Brian, if I could just add one more piece. No. I saw some uh, questions and comments come in around leadership buy-in. So another example around the oper operationalizing is um, the same organization that Brian's referring to also has a, a town hall, a weekly town hall led by senior leadership and essentially giving a, you know, kind of state of the state kind of update on a weekly basis, encouraging questions. Um, I believe we were told he gives his cell phone number out to employees in case they have a question they want to reach him. So, um, again, the, to the point of some of the questions and comments coming in, leadership buy-in is, is crucial. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lisa, for, for keeping an eye on that. And, you know, Jamie. Absolutely. And I will say, I was just, uh, and, and Eva, I, I think it's something you're going to address because she says most of the companies try to survive now. How could we convince them to create a psychological safety environment for their employees? And then, which is really, I know what, what we're addressing. So we'll, we'll speak to that a little more. And then, um, sorry, sorry, it's moving on me. Um, and, <laughs> <laughs> and then we have uh, microaggressive behavior is often a blind spot. How might you address that type of behavior to create psychological safety? Ah, uh, the microaggressions. Yeah, we, um... I think there are a couple of ways. So a couple of questions there. And I think let's, um, let's, let's begin with the question around kind of uh, leadership buy-in. Leadership buy-in is, is, is critical. And we're gonna talk in a minute, we're gonna provide an example of how to drive leadership buy-in. So thank you for that question. The second was around leaders uh, must model the right behavior. Interesting that there was a follow-up on microaggression, um, but you're absolutely right. Leaders have to model that behavior. Um, more reason to have these types of conversations and to practice these conversations in very safe environments. Um, the microaggressions, I think we see a lot of that getting addressed now through say DNI functions. Uh, I think that microaggressions that could very easily be something that you could address through through immersion. Um, I think it's it is you got to call it out when you see it. You got to learn how to recognize it and then call it out. Um, a lot of what we do within MindWise is helping people understand what it is they're observing, not just what they're feeling, but what they're observing. Lisa, anything to add on that? Yeah, and, and you know, the, the piece around microaggressions, which is such an important point, um, um, uh, you know, I think building self-awareness around it and the empathy piece, there's a lot, talk these, a lot of talk around building empathy and being aware of how that can make a huge difference. Um, uh, in the way that fear can inform microaggressions so that when you're talking about psychological safety and building an environment that's collaborative, um, it can really have a positive impact and hopefully 
allow that microaggression to be um, to be addressed in a more productive, less threatening way for the individual. Um, and of course, if, if there are times where um, it, it, it's not improving, then there, there needs to be good protocol in place to, um, to think about how to address it from, uh, in a way that's protective to the team and to the environment, as well as helpful to the individual. The other, the other question then around, hey, you know, my organization, we're just trying to stay afloat. We're in survival mode. I think, and forgive me, this might sound campy, but I think more now than ever, we need to establish a psychologically safe environment. I think the, the fact that we're in, we're in uh, um, um, just, just, just to survive, we're in survival mode, necessitates the conversation around psychological safety. I'd, and I'd also rather us think about it as a culture and not necessarily just as a thing um, it is, it's a culture and it is what will eventually help you retain and attract talent moving forward. Um, we, we know, and we can go into, we can provide all of this data for you, but we also know how it's tied to productivity. We know how psychologically safe environments, uh, help prevent presenteeism, um, help prevent things like absenteeism. So, you know, I think that there are, there are, there are, there's cost associated with this as well. We'll talk about in a minute. So this operationalizing piece, I get it, easier said than done, but it does require some courage. And I think for us, the best example is the chartering document, the chartering statement that this senior executive made at this global construction company. Uh, to this day, we use this as the exemplar. It is plain speak and it gets right at the issue, right at the issue that this particular organization is trying to address, not just within his organization, but the entire sector of construction. Um, so we applaud, we continue to applaud their efforts, find it to be incredibly courageous. And sometimes that's what it takes more than anything, some courage. Lisa, anything to add? Um, no, I think, I think that, good. Great, okay. So we wanna get, uh, we want to, get to the, uh, the demos, the immersion demos, but wanted to talk a little bit about this idea of absenteeism and presenteeism, and want to acknowledge that psychological safety, safety predictability control, all of this helps set an organization up to prevent presenteeism. We're all, we've all experienced that individual, and maybe it was, it was ourselves, but we've all experienced that individual that shows up to work that is checked out, isn't, isn't present, um, and in some sectors poses uh, a danger, a danger to him or herself or a danger to others. So while we don't want to affix a dollar amount to human life, acknowledging that that lost productivity nears a trillion dollars across the globe is truly remarkable. And the way we think about productivity is, yes, absolutely, organizations want to be productive. But me, if I don't feel productive, I'm not going to produce. And I will not feel as good about myself as I need to feel. So it's about the individual's sense of productivity. That's what enhances the organizational productivity or the organization for, or the productivity for the organization. Right. Yeah. And uh, so I'll add in terms of the cost, the financial cost to companies, um, when, they, when companies that are tracking this look at short-term and long-term disability costs, um, those that are attached to mental health issues, especially ones that have escalated, um, outweigh uh, major medical costs combined. Yeah. So, we, uh, what are we going to do about it? I think uh, the first, and we talked a little bit about this, is we need the language. We need to learn how to talk about this stuff. Um, and we're not, we're not treating this conversation, we're not trying to disrespect the conversation through the use of the word stuff, but let's just learn how to talk about this stuff. Second, is we need, we need data. Uh, we, need, we need to better understand um, we need that kind of baseline understanding across an organization. Uh, we need the data to inform program development. Um, 
we've got to ex maximize our existing investments and maybe that investment is in an EAP. So what sorts of things can your organization do to maximize that investment? And then finally, and I think Lisa, myself would argue most importantly, we need the safe places to practice these conversations um, to include spontaneous conversations. And Lisa, you alluded to that earlier. What do we mean by spontaneous conversations? So spontaneous conversations are exactly that. They happen um, in an unplanned fashion. And what the, one of the studies found is that these conversations, particularly coming from leadership, were incredibly uh, impactful and helpful. Um, on the contrary, the, um, there was a human resource executive article that came out that talked about 47% um, 40, of um, employees in a study that did approach their manager had a negative conversation and it had a negative impact. So when you think about that, when you think that 60% of employees want to be talking about this as a sense of relief and to help them professionally and personally, and yet in another study, 47 felt it was a negative experience. Um, it really lays the groundwork for why we need to practice the conversations and feel empowered and help one another feel empowered to be um, supportive and proactive. And with that, there's probably no better segue to practicing with immersion. So I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Jamie and we'll, uh, we'll set up the demo. Great. I tell you what, I'm going to introduce you to our avatar host here, and I believe, Brian, you're going to to do this first round through uh, quickly, yeah. right? So yeah. we'll let everybody else make sure they're off camera, and uh, let's, let's get Evelyn in here. Hi there. Hi there. Can you see and hear me clearly? Yes, we can, we can see you, Evelyn. Fantastic. All right, let's bring up the slide so we can review what we're gonna do today. Can you see the slide all right? Yes. Perfect. All right, Brian, we're gonna do a performance coaching scenario, managing the stress response of others. You're gonna be speaking with one of your employees, Max. He's generally effective. He's smart, dedicated, and passionate about his work, but his performance has started slipping since he started working from home. The desired outcome is to understand the situation and get Max's agreement on a plan moving forward. You can use strategies like recall the role of the psychological safety plays within your organization's culture, focus on safety, predictability, and control, help Max find sources of each, make certain he feels empowered, offer help or resources, for example, screenings, trainings, or EAP to support Max during this challenging time. So we're going to go ahead, and I know you're familiar with that, so I'll come back on in here. I'm going to bring in Max, and you can say, end simulation at any time. We'll go back, have a discussion, and then we'll let Lisa have a run through. Okay? Great. Thank you. Great. Max, good to see you. How are you? Um, hey, Brian. Uh, yeah, I'm 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 doing okay. Yeah, yeah. How uh, how are things uh, how are things at home? <laughs> wow, that's that's a loaded question, huh? Um, yeah. Just kind of, you know, we've we've got two little ones. Um, one's a baby, and I'm just I'm just I'm exhausted, Brian. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know. Uh, you know how our uh, our organization really uh, really really cares about its employees. Where, you know, I'm, Max, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about about your recent performance. How uh, how do you feel like uh, like you're doing? Wow. Um, well, I I mean, I know things have have kind of slowed down, and I don't feel quite as productive as I've been. And you know, I mean, my my wife said I should should maybe just let you know you know how crazy it's been around here and it's just it's with 
everything being trapped at home with the kids and, and not knowing what's next. It, I'm just, it's just a depressing time. You know, I really, I haven't felt like this since uh, I had a little situation back in college where I got really down and, and it, it, I just kind of feel like it's creeping in and I don't know what to do. Yeah, Max, I, 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 um, I, I hear you. I, I, um, I, I understand. I t tell you what, let's, let's do this. We, um, we have an EAP and how about, uh, how about I give you that phone number and why don't you, why don't you call the EAP? I just wish, uh, and there are just some things that I, I I'm not able to, to talk about. There are some questions, you know, you know how it is. I, I just, there's some questions I can't ask, but you know, our organization really cares and we want to make sure you get the help that you need. So how about calling the EAP? Okay. Um, yeah, you, you know what, Brian, uh, if it, if it comes to that, I'll do that. So, you know, I mean, I've got my wife and she's good to talk to you. So, so we'll, yeah. we'll see. Ma Max, let me just, let me just really encourage you to, to reach out to the EAP. Um, and, and, you know, and then, and then how about we, you know, we touch base in a couple of weeks. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. All right. Um, oh, listen, I, I hear the baby crying and, and my wife's got the other kid. I, I, I got to run. Okay. Okay. Well, we're, we're, I'm thinking about you. Just do me a favor. I, you know, reach out to the EAP for us. Okay. All right. Um, all right. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Max. All right, Brian, I'm going to go ahead and turn you back over to the group for the chat and then I'll be here when you're ready. Okay. Great. Thank you. So part of, part of what we, we were attempting to um, demonstrate is how many of us were trained to address those types of issues. Um, and while out of the gate, we're trying to say to this employee, Max, that, hey, we're concerned about him, we're concerned about his productivity, um, making it very clear that some managers, um, based on our training, to deflect to the EAP. Not that there's anything wrong with EAPs. They provide an invaluable service, but we're of the mind that there's probably a little more that manager could have done, should have done. Any, any, any comments, Lisa, from you on that before we go into the second demo? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's striking that when um, a person is opening up and on the other, on the other hand, they don't feel heard or they sense discomfort on the part of the manager that they kind of shut down. They kind of go within themselves and you could see that he was like, okay, I'm just going to talk to my wife and totally backed away from any kind of help seeking. Yeah. All right. So we've got a comment here in chat. Sorry, guys. Let me just pull up chat. Oh, good. Okay. Um, Thank you, uh, is that Erica? Forgive me, I can't quite read that, but yeah. Erica, uh, yeah, yeah. And again, we're not, we're not trying to throw EAPs under the bus. They provide an invaluable, invaluable service, no doubt. But let's, let's acknowledge that many of us were trained to defer to legal or, or through HR into an EAP. All right, let's, do in, let's move into our second simulation, our second demo. And Erica said, I'm glad you said that. You could feel the gap in the conversation. <laughs> True. Me. Oh. Sorry, I just got to get back to my controls here. Here we go. All right. Uh, let's see, Lisa, we're going to yes. have this conversation. Yes. Okay. Yes. Great. Fantastic. Great. Just to quickly review, we're going to do the same simulation. So I'm not going to run through all of it again because we just heard that. Okay. Right. You ready? Sure. Perfect. Yes, I am. Great. All right. Then we'll get started. You can see in here, Max, and you can say in simulation at any time. Sure. Hey Max, how are you? Hey Lisa. Um, hey, I'm 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 doing okay. Yeah, yeah. How's um, 
How's it going working from home? It's a whole new thing, huh? Oh, you could say that again. It's yeah. just, you know, it's honestly, it's crazy. We've got, my wife is here, but we've got two little ones, you know, a baby and we're trapped in this house and you just don't know what's coming up next. And it's, yeah. you know, it's, it's rough. It's a lot to manage. It's a lot to manage. Um, yeah. So, so do you want to talk a bit about how that's been? And, you know, I know we've started some uh, programs, as you know, um, really to support the well-being. Started that about a year ago before this, before the pandemic started. And um, there have been a few kind of talks about it, town halls. Did you have a chance to kind of go to any of those? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know that that was kind of started. And, and I'll tell you, my, my wife said I should probably just kind of share with you anyway that it's sure. just been so crazy around here. And um, yeah. honestly, I'm, I'm really trying to focus, but I'm finding myself. <sighs> yeah. I'm, I've just, I haven't felt this way in a really long time. Um, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of starting to feel like I did back in college when I had some, just, you know, some sadness and depression issues and, Sure. And I'm feeling that kind of creeping back in. And, and honestly, yeah. I, I just, I don't know what to do about it. Yeah. Well, I, I totally understand that. You know, in fact, I've been, I've been hearing and reading about that lately that, um, you know, given what we're going through, all of us, if there's something that's happened in the past or happening now, it kind of it can feel worse, worse during these times. But I, I mean, I, I really, I mean, I know, I, I know you, so I feel like this conversation is, is not going to go beyond you or me, but um, you know that's that's kind of a. I don't. Yeah. I don't really want to talk to anybody, and I, I don't want anything yeah. going on my record. You know, I don't. Yeah. Well, you know, Max. Firstly, I'm really glad you feel that you could talk with me about this. I, you know, we've worked together for for a year. You are always been just you know outstanding in terms of your engagement, your commitment. Um, just, you know, your contribution to the team and uh, the people you work with. Um, so, so first, I'm, I'm just glad that you felt you could talk to me about it. Um, you know, anything that I can do to help? I know we've talked about some strategies in, in the within the company about uh, communication or any, any kind of steps that you can take or anything that, that I can do to kind of support you around um, establishing some routines, things like that. Um, so, you know, wondering, um, you know, I, I'm asking this just very, you know, just because it, it's very true that a lot of people don't know some of the resources that we have. Um, I know I actually used some of the resources. So, for instance, the EAP. Um, have you ever kind of thought about the EAP or do you kind of feel like you know what our EAP services are? Um, wow. Um, I... I appreciate what you're saying here, Lisa. I do. Um, I just I'm a I'm a little concerned about putting that out. I mean, sure. I don't want anybody talking about it or knowing about it. Um, yeah. It's. I'm, I'm just yep. not sure if I want that out there. Yep, and and I you know again I think just just to clear that up because this comes up a lot. Um, so so the EAP is a service that we provide through the company completely private, completely confidential. So whatever gets talked about there stays there. It's an incredibly professional arrangement. Um, you know, we get, I think the company has six sessions per year, so it's kind of there for you to use. Um, you know, I, I, as I just kind of alluded to about a year ago, I was really worried about my teenage son. And honestly, we went as a family for about, you know, a few sessions and um, it was really helpful really helpful so just putting it out there um you know and and again i it's hard it's hard to take that step i think that first step is the hardest um anything i can do to support you in that i'm, I'm here okay so i i i think i hear what you're saying and i mean is that something that i can do virtually because we can't go anywhere right now oh yeah yeah you know these days everything's telehealth yeah 
And, and you know, these, um, even the platforms they use for telehealth are private, they're HIPAA compliant. So yeah, it's, um, yeah, very easy. You know, usually you can send them an email, you can call them, um, yep. Okay, I'm just, you know, it's it's a lot to think through, but I, I so appreciate you sharing sure. with me that, that you've used it and that makes me feel a little better that, that it's definitely yeah. not something that goes, you know, as we put it on my record with the company, uh, I was concerned yeah. about that. Um, but I feel like, you know, I, I'm not feeling as productive as I have been. And I, I don't know. I, yeah, I think it all just kind of spirals and, and the exhaustion with yeah. the baby and yeah. everything's just kind of piling on. Right. Right. And, and, you know, think about it. Think about it. Let's, why don't we check in? Why don't we check in end of the week uh, or next week, whenever you, yeah. you feel like it. Sometimes it's good to kind of let this stuff percolate a bit and then see if you want to, you know, you want to do it or try it. Yeah. No, I, I think I think that's great. And um, I believe I saw something. Yep. There's, there's an email in here, I think, that even has a how to get in yep. touch with them. So, so I appreciate that. Um, I'll, I'll take sure. a look at that. And and talk to the wife and and I think I think you may be right I think that's probably the route to go because um, I just want to feel like myself again yeah 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 it, it rough times but but we can get through this we can get through this all right thank you so much for your time I appreciate it Lisa of course anytime Max anytime and I'll, I'll see you in a week great yeah yeah take care. Oh, and there's there's the baby crying all right <laughs> got it uh, thanks bye -bye. there you go take care bye All right, nicely done. Just to remind everybody, this would be the time where, as the avatar host, I would take a moment to reflect with Lisa what went well, what we possibly could have seen her do differently. But I'm going to turn you back over to everyone at the round table. Thank you so much for giving us such an exemplar model of how to handle that situation with Max. We appreciate it. Bye bye. Thank you. Lisa. Nicely done. I think, uh, oh, thanks. you know, there were a couple of kind of recurring themes through chat. Uh, one was around empathy. Uh, mm -hmm. we, um, we know that at the root of psychological safety is empathy. Uh, the other, um, and I think this is really, really important. And one example we didn't share earlier is shared stories. Mm -hmm. we all have a story and Look, it requires some courage to share your story, our story, his story. Um, but you know, Lisa, we've been we've been in scenarios, we've been in situations where executives got up in front of 800 yeah. people and shared, you know, his or her story. That goes a long yeah. way. So um, cannot understand the significance of of sharing uh, our stories. Not that each and absolutely. Every there's something to be said about that. Um, any other reflections, um, Lisa, as you went through it? Uh, well, you know, I have to say when I mentioned the HIPAA, it felt like I slipped into clinical mode. I think probably most, um, most employers wouldn't know that, but I, but I did want to make the point because I think so much of us are dealing with now teletherapy and telemedicine that, that these are also uh, protected sites in the sense of being um, compliant with medical information. So just want to make that point. I think um, I think um, I felt like I didn't want to be pushing it. I felt like maybe I might have come across a little bit like overly encouraging. So I wanted to make sure that the door was open, which is why at the end I said, you know, think about it. Um, I'm a big believer that it takes a lot of um, touches of, of reaching out before you actually are ready to pick up the phone or send that email. So. Yeah, Christina, you you describe you know, the immersion solution as immersive. Uh, I'm, I'm, no matter how many times I've been through this, oh. it's so engrossing. It's so <laughs> like, like, I mean, it's, um, and I, I, we just, we just want to emphasize that safe environment and practice by no means are any of us experts at this, but given a little bit of language, um, given us some tools, some data to better inform what's happening across our organizations and then giving, giving us an environment, a safe environment to practice some tough conversations. I think, 
I don't want to presume, but you know, the 46 of us, we've probably had some tough conversations. And uh, uh, had we been given the opportunity to practice those, I wonder how those conversations would have gone. Would we have immediately deflected to an EAP or would we have spent a little more time you know, focusing on safety, psychological safety, who, who, who knows? But, uh, but anyway, that said, Christine, I'll turn it back to you. Yeah, I just want to echo how immersive it is. I mean, I feel like I'm going to see Max next week. So you really <laughs> yes. feel like you're in it. Yes, an absolutely right. stimulating, date. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> an absolutely stimulating conversation on chat. Um, I definitely want to continue the conversation. Uh, a lot of questions we don't have time to answer, but uh, we'll send around our, our information later so we can um, all follow up with each other. I'm getting a few questions about how exactly the technology works. Um, so before we finish today, I, I do want to share a little bit about that. Um, so it's not entirely a mystery. So the technology is a blend of AI and live human interaction. So the visuals are controlled by AI, which frees the simulation specialist, the live human operator behind the scenes, in this case it was Jamie, to parachute into those different characters, those different avatars at ease. So why the use of avatars? We get a lot of questions about that. Well, research actually shows that this dissolves social constructs and allows the learner to make mistakes, to be authentic, to really stretch themselves in that moment. The research shows that learners actually open up more to avatars than real people, you know, if you compare this to role play. And then there's also a scalability factor. One simulation specialist can parachute into different avatars at once. So think about designing practice where the learner has to interact with diverse groups of people. This is valuable for both external frontline skills like sales, customer service, and then also internal conversations, uh, whether it's, it's leadership or HR or just um, you know, general mental health related. Well, this allows us, this approach with the avatars allows us to mix and match um, those different characters, um, environments, and the scenarios, the content, to create practice that isolates and targets very specific learning challenges whether that learning challenge is talking about mental health or de-escalating a microaggression on a Zoom call or delivering an effective conversation about performance. So all this means that we could deliver more than 10,000 simulations a week and really scale those learning moments, those moments of transformation across regions and time zones. I think we have one project here at Immersion that actually um, spans seven different countries. So just a fun fact. So altogether, what we're doing is concentrating all the innovations at our disposal, bringing together the best in human and technology to create practice that has the ultimate impact. So it's progress that, that the learner can see and feel and progress that the organization can measure. You know? And that's what gives empathy a seat at the table. Uh, so mentioned that we definitely want to continue the conversation. Uh, we, at any time, if you would like to get in touch with us, please don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Jamie. Our, our email addresses are here. And if you forget our names, don't know where else to go, you can always go to immersion.com to have a conversation. And, and if you scroll down, you'll see a live chat. Um, feel free to speak to that live chat at, at any time. And uh, through that, you can reach either MindWise or, or Immersion. Um, Jamie will send a follow-up with a recording of the presentation, um, some relevant slides, as well as um, I, I think our LinkedIn information, um, the way to connect to Immersion, the way to connect to MindWise, and a link to our website, as always. Absolutely. We'll make sure we have uh, everybody's information so that you can connect. And if you have any further questions, you can. And I just wanted to share that that scenario, uh, we have something very similar. We we started out basing it on something that we have within our bank, but the way we've practiced it in the past is that Max doesn't really offer up that. It's something that me as the, the simulation specialist, that person behind Max would have that knowledge. And the practice is, is getting to the point where he's willing to share that so you can move forward. And, and as I was sitting here thinking about it, and Lisa and I, and Brian and I spoke this morning and we said, you know, we want to make sure that we practice having that uncomfortable conversation of when they do share it, how do you do it? How do you 
make them understand that you empathize and you hear them and you understand. So you're not just saying, go talk to somebody else, but you're saying it's going to help you if you go speak with somebody else, but you know, I'm, I'm hearing you because there's a difference in the way you deliver that. And as I was thinking about it, I thought, of course, this makes perfect sense because you're not going to go in and ask all of those questions to get to the point where he shares with you if you can't handle the conversation when he does. Right. Right. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, but it's great. But uh, just to be clear, that was kind of why we, we jumped it to that point for today. But we certainly have within our knowledge and, and our bank, those scenarios for the the post and pre side of that. And that is also something that I know that Lisa and Brian are well versed in helping with that communication, how to ask those questions, how to get to that point as well. So if you'd like to have a further discussion about that, please make sure that you reach out to MindWise, reach out to us, let us know, we'd be happy to, to talk to you. So Brian and Lisa, anything else before we, we say thank you and goodbye? No, you guys are great. You guys are great. Thank you. This was- uh, Thank you so much. This was wonderful. And uh, I did see in chat, you're absolutely right. May is Mental Health Awareness Month. So, so uh, enjoy the rest of the month. Thank you, Yes, everyone. indeed. And I would, I would make, I'd put everybody over to the panelists and have them sing happy birthday to you. But if you've ever tried to do that on a Zoom call, <laughs> you know that it is absolutely disastrous. <laughs> so- <laughs> Oh, that'd be so much fun. <laughs> I love that idea. As I, as I said, my, my daughter my daughter threw glitter on me earlier, so I just needed to make sure that all the glitter was off. That's right. <laughs> well, you had a sparkling conversation even without the glitter, so we so appreciate you, everyone. As we said, we'll follow up with a recording and information on how to reach out to everyone if you have any further questions. So have a beautiful day. We appreciate you and hope to see you next week. Thanks a lot. Bye guys. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye-bye.